Roland? Cool. Well, my name is Andrew Zuckerman, and I'm a researcher at Quali Research Institute, which is a nonprofit independent, independent group studying consciousness. And today I'm going to be talking about a software tool we made called the Tracer Replication Tool. Um, and I'm also going to talk about how it's used to collect qualia souvenirs. So this is a little snippet of the tool. And this is something that I made along with Lawrence and Andres, who are both working at QRI alongside me. And um, before we go into the tool, I'm going to zoom out and start with my own keychain collection. So when I was younger, I collected keychains and I didn't even put all of them here because I was embarrassed of, I think I have a little bit more than this, um, but you could get the idea. And, you know, what's the point of a keychain? Well, for me, I collected keychains when I was younger because I had so many keys. I'm just joking. I didn't have that many keys. The point of the keychain for me was like souvenirs for most other people. So um, some people collect mugs or postcards or for me, a keychain. And what's the purpose of a keychain or a souvenir in general? You know, it's to store information or a memory about some interesting event. So maybe you went to Boise, Idaho, and it was some memorable experience. So you get a postcard to remember that event and that vacation. Um, and there are many ways to store information from an experience. You could store text. Maybe you could journal or write a note. And so maybe you wrote, I saw a young girl looking at her shadow on a wall lit behind by multicolored lights. That's one way to store information. You could also store information with a photograph, which is what I show in the middle. Um, and it gives you even more information because it does everything that text just did and even more. There's like so much visual information there. And even better is a video, right? A video has moving information. You could see the way the girl looks at the camera. Um, if this video had sound, it'd be even more audio information. So it's more immersive, um, but you know, it doesn't capture everything. Because a video like doesn't capture the smells you smell or like the tactile sensation of what it feels like to be you in that moment. And it also doesn't capture emotion, right? So I could be really happy when I took this video or I could have been sad and nostalgic or something else. Um, and you would never get any of that information by looking at this video. Um, so videos are great, but they're not all the information. And um, especially they're not all the information on psychedelics or <laughs> altered states. And maybe you know this, right? You're on some altered state and you try to take out a camera or a video of something you see, but then you remember the camera is not tripping on a drug. So <laughs> even though your experience is altered and really interesting, the camera just records the same exact thing you record when you're sober. So it's really hard to like get the information of what it's like to be in an altered state. You know, and maybe the actual experience look more like this, um, or maybe it's even more colorful or strange or weird. And these emotions, we just can't capture it with the video. So, I mean, I'm not the only one that has thought about this dilemma. Um, <laughs> there are like some memes sometimes, this is on Reddit where someone says, guys, I finally understand and it's just a photo of a wall. <laughs> and right, like in the actual moment, you know, maybe this experience was super profound or beautiful, but this person was not able to capture the information back and all they could get was just this, this wall, which is, uh, you know, a phone could have taken that when you were sober. So um, here we are and our goal is really, we're trying to collect qualia souvenirs. We're trying to bring back information from conscious states. And now like, especially from exotic and altered states of consciousness, um, we have good technology, right? Photo, video, sound for recording what is like to be sober mostly, but when you're in an altered state, that's really challenging. So why should we collect qualia souvenirs? Well, one analogy from a different scientific field, biology, is that, you know, there were so many natural historians and biologists collecting and categorizing plants and animals and mushrooms. And over hundreds of years, they built up this taxonomy. And eventually, you know, this led to ideas such as evolution, which then led to ideas of genetics. And, you know, sorting nature and understanding the laws of nature lead to new ideas about it all works, how it all works. Um, and then you might end up with other like awesome outputs. So once you understand genetics, then you could do, um, you know, like help people fix diseases and like cure, cure illnesses. So in the same way that like collecting that data is so useful, um, probably collecting data from altered states and phenomenology is so useful if we're gonna eventually understand really important principles that explain the mind and explain, explain consciousness. 
Um, so, you know, today, how do we take information back? We do have text in the form of trip reports. We also have replications where people try to recreate some photo or video representation of what their trip was like. And then, you know, there's psychedelic artwork, which all these things are such, you know, awesome already, um, but we could go even further. And so now I'm gonna like walk you to the tool we made at QRI and it's the tracer replication tool. So this is what it looks like. Um, it sits right now on the internet and the format is that there is two balls. One is bouncing and is no effects on it. So on the right side, you just see a bouncing ball. And on the left side, you have the ability to recreate what you're seeing in your visual field from tracers in your psychedelic experience. And there are all these parameters that you can use to affect what the tracer looks like and the goal is to eventually recreate what you're seeing and then submit that as a data point um, for psychedelic research. So take back some quality souvenir from your experience. And just to recap, like what is a tracer? Well, um, if you, you know, move your hand in front of your face, even when you're sober, there's like a little bit of a blurriness where your hand is leaving. Um, on psychedelic drugs in particular, that you know, trail is even more accentuated and there is a good representation on the left here of someone throwing an object and you can see this huge trail following it. Um, and um, this is essentially what a tracer is. <laughs> so for us, like, you know, why tracers in particular? Um, I think Andres said it really well in this write-up of our tool. Um, and he wrote, the artifacts of perception in alien states of consciousness are not noise. They provide hints for how normal experience is constructed. And in particular, you know, psychedelic tracers they could be a window into how rhythmic feedback dynamics are used to control the content of our experience. Uh, so another way to just think about this is that, you know, if our perception of this world in any moment is almost like a movie, um, in normal sober experience, the frames are moving so fast and are so short that it's really hard to understand how is this movie being made? Like, what's the mechanics that's generating the movie? But when you are on these psychedelics and you have these tracers, they can reveal clues about, okay, well, how long is a frame and what are the properties of this movie construction system? So in these alien states, we get extra details about how this visual perception system is working. Um, so the rest of the presentation, I'm gonna pull a lot of information from this write-up that Andres wrote. Um, and this is online on the internet too, that we can link to. Um, so before we started this project, the only previous study we know of that looked into the tracer effect and trying to quantify it was called Visual Trails and it was about 10 years ago. So the way the authors went about this study is they took a movie and turned a movie into the stroboscopic poster that you're seeing here in the middle of the screen. And they did it with different frequencies. So maybe, you know, this has, I don't know, like 15, 20 after images that are all stitched together. Um, you might have a same like size poster, but like above might only have five or six, you know, snapshots. And so these represent like different frequencies that you're pausing the video at and taking a still. And so what they found just from people's memories when they looked at these photos and said, okay, what was it like when you took LST? Which photo represents that most? A lot of people from their memory said 15 to 20 Hertz. Um, so that is already like an awesome first step in quantifying these tracers. But this study has limitations. And that's because um, first of all, tracers are drug dependent and dose dependent, right? So maybe on LST, the tracers change as you increase the dose. Um, and this is like super dependent on which drug you take. And the other thing is there are different tracer effects. So in all of these recreations, we can isolate a few different effects. So in this one and the first one, there's a trail. And this trail effect is just like the general blurry motion that follows the object. They're also in the middle, what we call a stroboscopic effect, where as these hands move in and out, they leave a copy of the hand where it once was in the frame. And the hand that is left over doesn't move. So it's just still. And then the last effect we call replay, where as you move a hand, it leaves copies of the hand, but they move and follow with the original motion. So that's a replay effect. Um, so we made this tool to allow you to, you know, create any of these effects to any degree and adjust tons of parameters. Um, you know, one of the first ones is the trail effect. So you could control how long or like how large the trail follows your moving ball and also how intense it is. So if it's like really dark or really light, there's a, some other effects too, but for now, this is an important uh, intro. Then we have a strobe effect, which is, like I said, leaves a copy of the ball behind. Um, in this case, they just stay still. And then you also have the replay effect, which is like the strobe, but these times, this time they move. And you could change the frequency. Again, you could change the intensity of this and how long they persist. Um, 
After that, we included a couple other modifiers. So this is called an ADSR envelope. And this comes from audio engineering. It stands for attack, decay, sustain, release. And it's how you know some sound or amplitude moves over time. And in this case, when it leaves this second ball or third ball, that ball has like its own way of like fading out, which it could like happen very sharply and then trail off. And so um, you could add on these ADSR envelopes if you want to get even more fancy and share even more detail about what the tracers are like. We also have a color pulse. So um, for now, it's just the inverted color on the color spectrum. And people on certain drugs report this color switching. So we allow them to add this also as an effect. And they could change the frequency as well. And now it's like important to get into, OK, like what have we seen so far? So we haven't run any big studies so far. We created this tool. and. Um, shared it with people in a network and um, some people submitted data about you know, what tracers are like. And the first thing we found like a couple different categories with the limited data we have. The first is that there is this common light trailing effect with THC, so cannabis, and also HPPD, which is a perceptual disorder that some people get actually from taking psychedelics. Other people have it without taking psychedelics. Um, but when people are looking at the ball in the States, there's this small trail effect. Um, a second outcome is that psychedelics tend to have these strong replay and strobe effects. So this is 2CB in two different doses um, and two different methods of being ingested. And you can actually see what's interesting, the frequency of both of these data points are actually quite similar, um, which you know is starting evidence that, huh, maybe like 2CB has a specific frequency. Um, and then with another drug, DMT, you can see, oh, wow, like, <laughs> first of all, this is crazy because is this really what it looks like if you're on DMT and looking at this little ball bouncing on the screen? Um, and I guess the answer is yes, this is what it looks like. Um, but yeah, there's also heavy stroboscopic and replay effects. And then some one last like category that we found is that um, drugs like 5-MeO DMT and MDMA have this smooth quality to it that you could create with the ADSR envelope, or um, you could create like with the mixture of the trail and the strobe, and you could tell that they're like a little softer and smoother. So, you know, how could we use this data we're collecting? Um, first of all, you know, so far we're just collecting data from phenomenology, but ideally you can take this data from phenomenology and mash it with neuroimaging data of someone in the same state. So you get collect both at the same time. And um, this opens up some like pretty interesting questions that would be great to answer. One is, you know, if you see a 15 hertz stroboscopic effect or replay effect, is there some 15 hertz brainwave that we can identify in the visual cortex? And if there is like, oh, that's like a pretty good start of an explanation. And if there isn't any 15 hertz oscillation anywhere, that also is like raises some interesting questions like, huh, so how is this effect being generated? Um, and so like, if we can continue this research further, it's important to collect brain data too to start making interesting conclusions about what the brain is actually doing. Um, the other thing is that so far our pilot data is pretty consistent with anecdotal evidence. So these are two replays or replications that people have made online that I found. And you could tell like, you know, DMT in this replication, just like in our tracer tool, seems to be really high frequency. Like in time, it's changing pretty fast between colors and um, flashing. So from what we've collected and what people you know, have historically wrote, the data already lines up. OK, so what can we do besides you know, learning about the brain? What can we do with this kind of tool? There's a really interesting couple things that I want to share. The first is a way, a high meter, to standardize how intense a drug is affecting someone. So right, you have a certain thing, which is the dosage, but maybe you know, a dose of 100 micrograms for someone affects someone really differently than someone else. Um, it could be because of their body and their size, or it could be something with their brain. Um, but this way, you know, if you create this tool and you find out that, OK, like the average person on 100 micrograms, this is what they see on LSD, 200 micrograms, this is what they see, and so on. Then you know, if someone comes to you and fills out this tool, regardless of their dosage, you can say, oh, like what you took, that's you know, typical of a 100 microgram LSD trip. So it's a way to standardize actually how intensely psychedelics are affecting someone. And in, with enough data, maybe you could even reverse engineer what drug someone took. So you're at a music festival and someone comes and they don't even know what drug they took. They could use this tool, try to fill out what their tracers look like. And depending on that, you know, you could use some statistics to figure out, oh, it's like most likely that you took this drug at this dosage. Um, so this seems like a really cool possible application. Another awesome one is the idea of understanding drug synergy. So imagine we had two different drugs, drug A and drug B. 
And you can see they have different um, like replay frequencies. This one's even stroboscopic, this one's replay. And the question is, right, if someone take both of these drugs at the same time, what happens? Um, so there's a couple of possibilities. One is that um, the drugs are orthogonal, their effects in the sense that one and taking the second one, they don't interact at all. So you just have a stacking, an overlay of one effect on top of the other. Um, you might also have suppression where it seems like drug B could heavily suppress drug A. And you see that because the tracer that someone recreates on A plus B mostly looks like drug B. You might also have synergy where the combination of the two drugs is actually even stronger than just the sum of the effects combined. And you might also have something like harmonization where um, you have two different drug frequencies, but they end up like tuning each other towards some middle frequency in between. Um, and this is to me is like also super fascinating because you know, if you want to understand drug interactions previously, maybe you'll have to look at neurotransmitter levels or something more invasive to see, okay, how are these two drugs interacting and in what ways? But now, like if you just help people become better phenomenologists, we might have the evidence just online in a non-invasive way about how drugs are interacting. Um, and to me, that is awesome as well. And then one last effect is understanding the relationship between uh, harmony and valence. Valence is how good or bad an experience feels. So we, besides collecting these tracers, if we start collecting data about, um, okay, when you're seeing this tracer that you just recreated, do you feel good and do you feel bad and like at what intensity? And if we start to see that, um, okay, like when people feel really good, they also have these super consonant and smooth tracer effects. And when they feel really bad, they have these more dissonant effects. That might be evidence in, in favor of something at QRA that we have called the symmetry theory of valence, which is an explanation of why things feel good or bad. And uh, I don't have time to go into that, but I'll let you explore it on your own. We have a YouTube video and some writings as well. So next steps for this project. So um, right now we're working to get RFP approval so we can actually collect large amount of data using this tool. And besides that, we also want to add some other perceptual tasks that we think will be especially like large effects with people who use psychedelics versus people who don't use psychedelics. So um, right now we're in that process and hopefully you know, in the next year, We'll have even more data to share about what, what we're finding. Um, and, you know, I'd like to end by kind of just talking about phenomenology and how important it is once again, because um, really there's so much rich information in a psychedelic experience that um, it would, you know, we try sometimes to categorize our experiences at the end of a whole trip and we use some type of survey and these are really good at, like, at a, as a baseline for getting information about what an experience is like. Um, but if you think about it, a psychedelic experience might be different, so different, like every 10 minutes. Um, and there's so much rich information about what it's like to be you when you're taking a psychedelic that um, if we can figure out better ways to collect that information and also pair it with brain data, um, we're gonna have a much better understanding of how these things work and how also how consciousness is created. It's like a way to reverse engineer our experiences. Um, and specifically for psychedelic researchers, uh, they should not be ignorant of maybe past psychedelic experiences they've had when they approach their research. They should use their experiences to inform research questions and say, oh, wow, that was like some really interesting effect I had, you know, two summers ago. Let me come up with a study or like an approach to isolate this specific effect. Um, and it's really important that we <laughs> like study these states in depth because they are like these altered states, these boundary conditions of what consciousness and neuroscience can create. And it's almost like if we're physicists, it would be like, if we don't take these seriously, it would be like not taking black holes and plasma and superfluid helium seriously. Um, and trying instead just to understand the brain or understand our universe sitting in room temperature in, a, in your living room and like trying to understand it that way or sitting, you know, just with your sober brain and trying to understand how neuroscience and consciousness works. Um, so with that, I will end my presentation. And I'll thank you for listening and I'll open the floor if any of you have questions.